time in a place to serving God under sometimes extremely difficult circumstances and in your case somewhat dangerous ones too. That's right, life threatening ones. This is a very good this is a very good magazine, this particular one, which is the magazine we're going to use for this week. Now I could have taken Ted Wilson's message and read it to you, but I thought why should I deprive you, first of all, of something else and secondly, it's well enough written for you to enjoy it without any assistance, okay? So, but please, this theme and this particular set of lessons and this particular period in the history of the church at large during which we're looking at the Reformation and its effects have, have flowed together to, I believe, do something enriching for our church, very enriching. Please, read. Okay, now... What I have to share with you today is not meant to reflect on churches today necessarily, although that you will have to, to work out for yourselves based on what you see and what I tell you today. I am merely being an historian today. Okay, I'm going to tell you the facts and I'm going to interpret those facts in a way which I think is legitimate, okay? And you may interpret them in whichever way you wish, but I do think that I have a point. And that's why I want to share that with you. So, I'm going to ask whether I can, if I took that off and stood to the side, that wouldn't be a problem? Pull hard, yep, good, I'll do that. Oh, all right. I can take that one then. Right. Let me do that. Okay. Does that suit you? Okay. I, I do want to be able to see what's on the screen, and I don't really want to be in your way. Okay. So it is on. Hello? Okay. You know what? You are a gem. <laughs> you know that? She is. You know... Normally, I would really not want a backseat driver, you know, but in church with technology, no, no, it, with, in church with technology, I think you are just the best thing since sliced cheese. Oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right, let me see if I've got this right again. I think it's all right. Come on, yeah. Right, let's have a look just, just for a moment at that verse. Matthew 4, verse 4, which you read for us so beautifully. But he answered, it is written, and there he was referring to the Bible and quoting from the Bible, wasn't he? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And, that, and that's at the heart of what I want to say to you today. We've been, we've been hearing about this man on television, in our lesson discussions, uh, Perhaps in, in, in your Sabbath schools, I don't know. Martin Luther, okay? Martin Luther, who is regarded as perhaps one of the greatest reformers, Protestant reformers. Remember, there were also Roman Catholic reformers, okay? And there were many different Protestant reformers as well. He was by no means the only one. There were some who came before him, and many have followed after him. Martin Luther. Now, what made him so famous, or in the eyes of some people, infamous? You tell me what you think after what you've heard. What made him so famous? When you think of Martin Luther, what do you think of? What was that? The 95, the 95 Theses. He took them and where did he go? To the church in Wittenberg, and he did something which was done every week. You put your notices on the church door. Remember, this is before there were newspapers. This is before they handed out things in the streets. And so he had, he had an issue. He had 95 issues, actually, and he wanted them to be known and to be discussed. And so we know him for the 95 theses. But why would he be infamous 
Why would he be infamous? Yes? Because some people... Do, yeah. This is to do with like Catholics and Protestants like they get along. Remember, there was only one church at that time in that area, right? That we call Europe and and adjacent areas of Asia, sort of Europe, okay? It was only, only one church. It was the Church of Rome. It was the church that had its headquarters at the Vatican. Next to that, in Asia, there was the Orthodox Church, which was also Christian, but it didn't have the Pope as its head, okay? So there was only one church, and he was a faithful member of that church. That's the interesting thing about it. And when he was upset and he had these 95 theses and he went and nailed them on the door, he wasn't intending to break up his church, to split his church. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to make his church better. He wanted to help his church. He wasn't a raging bull who just wanted to destroy. He was actually a man who wanted to help, to guide his church. Okay? Got the background on that? He wrestled for an, with a number of things in his own personal life. The very first thing that he wrestled with, and he wrestled with this for years, and when you read the history of Martin Luther, you will know that he wrestled with sin. He felt himself to be a very bad person. And he was a monk, a priest, a pastor. He was actually a teacher of theology, but he felt that he was not a good person, that his thoughts were not always pure, that his actions were not always good, and he was actually very, very angry with himself. And he tried his best to be a good boy, literally, not to do anything bad. And there were times when Martin Luther lay on the floor in the middle of winter with the least amount of clothing on, then flipped over onto his back and then onto his tummy in order to punish himself for being bad. He even took a birch branch and he whipped himself because he felt so bad. And he thought by hurting himself, he would make himself better. And his life was really quite a struggle against or with his conscience. But you know what? This wasn't just because he felt bad. It's because he wanted to be right with God. He wanted to be a friend of God. He wanted things between himself and God to be okay. So he passionately wanted to be right with God, and he was really upset with himself. This is Martin Luther, the background. And he finally discovered that it could only be by grace through faith. He had this discovery, this, this sudden insight into the fact that it's not all about me. It's actually about what Jesus has already done. And I don't have to keep whipping myself. I need to say thank you, God, and accept salvation, which is coming freely by grace. And this was Martin Luther. He's not the only person to have discovered this. You know who discovered this on the road to Damascus? Saul. And they changed his name didn't they? To Paul. And he on the road to Damascus realized that he wasn't a good guy actually. And that he needed God in his life. And he discovered this. And that's why he wrote the book of Romans. And Martin Luther read the book of Romans. And you know what, my boy? He saw a verse there that said the just shall live by faith. He read it many times but suddenly he realized true for him. So this is Martin Luther. He wasn't actually he wasn't actually trying to destroy the church or make things difficult for the popes of those, of those days. But the one thing that it caused this this 95 thesis thing right? The one thing that it caused it was this this in those years there was no printing industry, not like there is today. And things were sometimes written by hand, and sometimes they were printed in a primitive way, one page at a time, and it was a very, very costly 
process. And so Bibles, Bibles are extremely expensive and very scarce. But there were Bibles in all of the cathedrals and the big churches. And he used to go to the cathedral. He didn't have an app at home with a Bible on it. He didn't even have a Bible in his hands. He had none of that. He used to go to the cold church, kneel on that, you see it, on that concrete there, and he would read the Bible. And can you see the chains? Well, it was practical to chain the Bible because, you know what? If someone stole a Bible, they could get a lot of money for it. Imagine that, Bible stealing. Okay? And if somebody took it somewhere else and put, I'll read it tonight and didn't bring it back, be very embarrassing the next day for the minister. So, yeah, this is it. This is where the trouble started, here. Martin Luther read the Bible for himself. In which language, by the way? Latin. Latin. You're right, in Latin. Sorry, it, I'm just going to leave that there. He read it in Latin. At that time, there was only a Latin Bible. Unless you were a, a student of, of Koine Greek or of Hebrew, you wouldn't be able to read anything else but the Latin Bible. They call it the Vulgate, and we'll talk about that later. But that's in German. Sorry? That is in German. Yeah, but this isn't the Bible. No, this isn't the Bible yet. We're getting there. So Martin Luther read the Bible, and he made this discovery about how you're saved. And then you know what happened. This fellow called Tetzel, and I'm sure you've heard of Johann Tetzel, he came through... Saxony, he came through the German states and he was doing something to promote the offerings or to increase the wealth of the church because the church needed money to build very, very swanky buildings, right? And they were selling something called an indulgence. An indulgence was just a piece of paper with a stamp on it or a signature and it said, and this is the part that really got him excited. Anyone speak German? Yes. Right. Read that for me, please. In von acht alle Heiligen ohne Erhaltung gegen dich absolviere ich dich von allen Gründen und mittleren das alte Deutsch. Mittlere das sind ein Erlasser der alle Kraften auf die zehn Tage Okay. Basically what, the, thank you very much. Basically what this was saying was this. If you would like to pay some money, you can be absolved, right? From your sins. You can be absolved from your sins. Just like you go to the supermarket and you buy a packet of chips. You can be absolved from your sins. And do you know how Martin Luther felt? Never. It's impossible. I know it's not that way. And I want everyone to know it's that, not that way. And so, because of the indulgences that were being sold, Martin Luther took up the issue of justification by faith. And that's why this happened. It wasn't the only point, but it was the starting point, the spark that got things going. And let's come to this Bible again, right? This is the Vulgate. This is, the actual, this is an actual Vulgate in Latin. You can see the Latin there, right? And the reason it was called Versio Vulgate, or Virgin Vulgate, or Vulgata, is simply this, because the version commonly used is actually the translation of Vulgata. Okay? Or the Vulgate for short. So this was just the commonly used Authorized Latin version, just like the King James Version was. Right? And Luther actually did something interesting to help him translate this Bible from Latin. He didn't translate from Latin, by the way, he translated from the original languages of Greek and Hebrew. But in order to do this, it says that he actually went to listen to the people in the marketplaces and in the towns. He listened to them speaking so that he could understand their language and translate it as closely as possible to the contemporary usage. In fact, Martin Luther didn't just actually create a Bible. He actually established 
the official high German of his day. It was because of him that the language began to change as well. Right, and this is actually the Luther Bible, the Lutheran Bible, okay? It was, New Testament was published in 1522 and the Old Testament in 1534. When this happened, and Martin Luther kicked back against people who were saying to him, hush, hush, you can't talk about this, don't, you're not allowed to do this, right? It began what is called the Reformation. And the Reformation, that where you see the red, is Protestant. Where you see the yellow and red is a mixture. Where you see the yellow, right, that is pure Catholicism. Okay. And there was actually war. There was war. Europe was at war. There was war in the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically Germany. There was war in France, eventually. Not all at the same time. And there was persecution in Spain. And there was, at some stage also, upheaval here in this country. When we had a change from a Catholic to a Protestant kingdom. So this is the time of Martin Luther, right? Any questions? Any questions? I'm telling you, if you think Theresa May has caused problems for Europe, <laughs> no, Martin Luther really did. He caused problems for Europe much wider, with much deeper <coughs> impact than you could ever believe. So, let's quickly rush on. We're back to the Bible again. And this is what's interesting. This is what Luther actually did that really changed things. First of all, he translated the Bible into the common language of the people. Right? At the same time, because printing was available in a new form, it was relatively cheap to print those Bibles. And quite fast. And it was rapidly disseminated. So that people were within weeks of the Bible actually being produced, using it in England. Do you know that? They were using it in this country, in England. And they were discovering things. And they were using these writings here and translating them. So we then actually see that the, the real problem that Martin Luther caused was that he gave people something with which to replace tradition. Up to that point, if the Bible was in a language no one could understand in Latin, it was chained to a pulpit, there was only one of them perhaps in the whole town, the priest could tell you whatever he wanted, and you wouldn't have any way of proving that he was talking nonsense. That's the reality of it. And that's why the brief story I'm going to end with, which I'm going to tell you quickly, came into being. But before I say that, Seventh-day Adventists, in the introduction to our fundamental teachings, say this, Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as the only source of our beliefs. We consider our movement to be the result of the Protestant conviction, sola scriptura. The Bible is the only standard of faith and practice for Christians. So are we actually heirs of the Reformation? Yes, we carry on that tradition, aren't we? And at the core of our beliefs, in fact, belief number one, the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testament, are the written word of God given by divine inspiration. In this word, God has committed to humanity the knowledge necessary for salvation. There you have it. That was what Martin Luther was about. Not tradition, not hearsay, not what important people have written or said, not what decrees have become out of the church councils, but what does the Bible say? Finish. Full stop. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Yes, you may. Um, I know that the uh, Catholic Church or the Pope... Remember, we're not... I just want to make this clear. We're not trying... I'm not trying to, to necessarily point fingers at the present people. That's something you will go home and think about, right? But your question... It's just that the, maybe the papal bull or tried to, but the, there was a great fear of the Catholic Church at that time. Can you tell me why? 
Yes. Because of a thing called excommunication. Remember the people were told that if they didn't have mass and they didn't do this and they weren't given the last rites and they weren't having daily mass or weekly mass or mass at times of funerals and things like that, they were not going to go to heaven. Okay? That was it. If you in any way disturbed that and you spoke against that or said that you didn't need the priest in order to be forgiven, remember the priest actually forgave you, you could be excommunicated. Right? Now, excommunicated, you guys, you know what it's like? Having a girlfriend, and one day you come to see her, and she doesn't look so happy, and she says to you, you are now my ex. What's that mean? You finished. You don't come back. You're, you're out of my life. Am I right? Who's got an ex that they keep on seeing? No, he's an ex, he's finished, he's gone. That's it. It's over. And that meant you couldn't be buried. If you die, you couldn't be buried in a churchyard. Do you know that? You could be left on the side of the road. It actually meant that people could kill you and get away with it. It was a feared, feared thing. It was absolutely totally unbiblical. And that is why people actually went after people who had been excommunicated, sent soldiers after them and had them caught and burnt at the stake, deep, beheaded, whatever. But why did they actually leave Luther alone? No, they didn't. They didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't, but they tried to. Luther was saved after he was at the Diet of Worms. Luther was saved because somebody, he was quite fearless, by the way. He was going to go home on his own, all the way back to Wittenberg. But some of the people realized that they were going to kill him. And so they sent kidnappers. And good people kidnapped him. How do you like that? And took him away to a castle where he was, there, where he was for a few years. And during that time, he was able to translate the New Testament. It's a wonderful story, actually, of how God works. But I can't dilly dally too long. What did Jesus say? It is written. Okay? It is written. That's what's important. Now, how long did it take to write the New Testament in the Greek, the Koine Greek of the day? Here is when Jesus uh, came into started his ministry. And that's when he died in 31 and in 34, the stoning of Stephen. These historical facts, right? How long did it take then for the Bible to be complete? Not bound, but to be written in all its different books and available, right? We reckon around about 48 AD, perhaps 50, 52, the Bible was begun. People began to write their, 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 their gospels and epistles and so forth. And that by around about the year 100, the process was over. How long? So from 50, when they started, till 100? 50 years. 50 years and all of those things have been written. And you know what? This is what happened after that. This is what happened after that. And this is the sad part of the history of Christianity. Just after this time that the Bible uh, was available now, there was the Vestas Latina, that's the old Latin versions, and they were actually not written by one man, they were just little bits here and there that were tr translated by individuals, and they were known as the old Latin version, right? But in the 4th century, Jerome was asked to begin a translation for the church. And you know how long that translation actually was in force. It's right up there in front of you. That's how long that went unchanged. And beyond that, until the 1970s, 
where there was a new Vulgate, a revision of the Vulgate. So for all of those years, there was only one version within the church, and it was in Latin. And how many people do you think in Europe could speak Latin? Very few. Only the priests, usually, the scholars, right? And maybe, and maybe some of the politicians. Everybody else had to just listen to what the priest said. And dare not, dare not contradict. Okay? So the most influential Bible then for the next, until the present day, for many, many Christians, was the Vulgate in Latin. Go ye into all the world and do what? Did Jesus say? Preach the gospel. How can you preach the gospel if you don't have it to give to them in their language? Am I right? Yeah. So what's going on here? Okay, and I'm going to spin quickly through. The Gothic Bible was actually an exception. And it was for the people living in Eastern Germanic areas, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth, Hungary. Any of you here have heritage from that area? I've got some. You've got some? Yeah. Okay. So, there was this translation of the Gothic Bible. It's an old Gothic language, okay? That took place in the 4th century. But it didn't come to anything. Okay? The Pope Innocent the third said, banned all unauthorized versions, right? You can't have them. The synods of Toulouse and Tarragona outlawed possession of them. You weren't allowed to even have them in your home. The complete Bible was translated into Old French in the late 13th century, but it didn't really amount to much. The entire Bible was translated into Czech around 1360. Wycliffe's Bible in English in 1383, and it was banned in 1408 by the church. It was Middle English, right? Not modern English, Middle English. Off his death, Wycliffe's death, you know what they did? They were so hateful over what he did that he translated this. He was a priest. He was one of the, the members of the church. You know what they did? They came to his graveyard with a coffin. So, without a coffin. They dug up his coffin. They threw his bones into a fire. They burned them to ash. And they took them to the nearest river and they scattered them in the river. Okay? That's how much they hated him. Just because he translated the Bible into Middle English so that people could read it. The Hungarian Hussite Bible appeared in the mid-15th century. In 1478, this is interesting, a Catalan translation in the dialect of Valencia. Okay? And then, an old Belarusian translation in those years. And then this happens. In 1521, Luther was put under the ban of the empire in Wartburg Castle where he translated the German New Testament. They banned him and put him in the castle, and actually they gave him the opportunity to complete the New Testament. God is not going to be messed with, okay? It was printed in 1522, and the complete Bible finished in 1534. There's just one more I want to give you. The first complete Dutch Bible, partly based on the existing portions of Luther's translation, was printed in Antwerp, in 1526 by Jacob van Liesveld. He got hold of Luther's Bible and he translated it into Dutch. Okay? Now, these are the questions. Or well, these are the realities. Rome repressed the reading of Scripture is an of missing and promoted tradition. Have you got it by now? They did not want people to know what was in the Bible. And this is probably one of the most terrible things that has ever happened in Christian history. This is it. 
It's sobering and sad. And then, at the same time, through all these years, the Holy Spirit was moving men to translate it. You see what I've told you? People were trying. Okay? The Gothic, the Belarusian, the Czech, the French, the Valencian. Okay? People were actually being moved on by the Holy Spirit to produce Bibles in the vernacular, in the people's language. And they were being resisted, weren't they? You're not allowed to. We ban that, we ban that, we ban that. And so we come to this. Why then did history have to wait for Luther? If all these Bibles were being printed, why is it that history had to wait for a man, Martin Luther? I'm going to give you the answer, as I see it. Because of the man. Luther had many, many weaknesses. And he needed justification by faith. Because works were not going to get into heaven. He had his weaknesses. But Luther was courageous. Nobody intimidated Martin Luther. Nobody bullied him. Luther was going to do it because his conscience told him he would do it. Nobody browbeat that man into submission. He walked away from the Diet of Worms, which was a great parliamentary meeting, without any defense, without anybody looking after him, he was going home, trusting in God. And fortunately, the kidnappers got to him before the others. This man was unafraid. Unafraid. But there was another reason. And God has his timing. Perfect timing. And that reason is technology. For it was then that the world was ready to take the message, the gospel, the Bible, and to print it quickly, very quickly, and relatively cheaply, and disseminate it widely. So within, within the very year, within the years that followed, the German Bible was being distributed everywhere and printing the movable type, the metal movable type of printing, which we no longer use, came to the rescue of the Word of God. I want to close by saying that we are privileged. Guys, you know, whether it's in an app, or a printed Bible, or whatever it is, the fact that we have a Bible is such a privilege. Can you imagine a thousand years, a thousand years, no Bible available, and then comes Luther, and it's only a German. We still have to have English, Dutch, all the other languages, right? What a privilege we have to have that word in our hands. Please read it, okay? Read it. And in closing, I want you to catch a glimpse of what it meant to be like Martin Luther. And hopefully, we have the same spirit in our hearts as he had in his day. By the way, it's the parliament, the German parliament. Thank you. 
Christian world and ruin the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. <coughs> Most ring emperor, illustrious princes, noble lords, I am only a man and not God. But I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, if I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. I feel as though you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you repent? Or will you not? You ask for a simple answer. Here it is. Unless you can convince me by scripture, and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the text of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right no same. Therefore, I cannot and I will not repent. Here I stand. You know us. So there you see it. You see that he was not willing to perpetuate the power of tradition. He wanted the Bible center stage. And when Luther said, I will not recant, he was actually signing, although it never happened, his own death warrant. Do we have that kind of conviction? What about you guys? Could be, someday. You might have to stand like Martin Luther. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we trust that we have not bored the saints. But we ask that some of these things would have deposited themselves in our minds and hearts. And that we would become like Martin Luther like the Apostle Paul, like Jesus Christ, like all the prophets and the apostles and all those who followed Luther, willing to stand for your word and its truth. In Jesus' name.